Hey guys, welcome to Horology Biology. On this episode, I've got a very special watch with a lot of sentimental value, which has been sent in by one of the subscribers of the channel. It is the Enica Super Dive Ed Mark I. It's a fully automatic watch, and of course, it's a diver's watch. Now, the question is, what is a diver's watch doing on the wrist of a pilot, and not just any old pilot at any old time? This watch was worn and owned by Major Coop, who was a military fighter pilot for the American Air Force from the 1960s until the 1990s. And obviously, given the time frame and the locations that I've been told about this watch, this watch was serving during the Vietnam War. Now, the owner of this watch is Ken, who is the son-in-law of Major Coop. And he explained to me that this watch was purchased anywhere between 1965 and 1966 in Japan at the military base where these guys were stationed. And I find this kind of interesting and cool at the same time that you could actually buy watches of such a good quality at a military base. Something I've not heard of before, but apparently that's exactly how it is. The other thing that I found interesting as well was why on earth did he choose a diving watch rather than a pilot watch, of course, being a pilot? And the answer that I was told was that he, him and his friends used to like going scuba diving and they all purchased similar watches at around the same time. So that's kind of like a nice, interesting thing to hear. What I was also told as well was that he did wear this watch on many missions during the time that he served and he also used to wear it on the inside of his wrist. So this is why the original crystal ended up being replaced for a non-original crystal because the original one just had so many scratches, was so worn out that it basically just died a death. So of course, now that the watch is in my capable hands and it's with yours truly, I'm gonna basically fully strip down this watch. I'm gonna inspect all of the parts, I'm gonna run it through the cleaning machine, I'm gonna rebuild it, and of course, I'm gonna oil it and regulate it so that I can get it back to Ken exactly where it belongs. In 1972, Coop was a major and a flight commander in the 8th Special Operations Squadron, stationed at an airbase in Vietnam. He flew the A-37 Dragonfly, which provided close air support for ground soldiers. I was actually told a story about this, and he explained that a young pilot named Lieutenant Michael Blassie that was transferred under his command after flight school. He said the pilot was courageous but flew too aggressively, putting himself and other pilots at undue risk during missions. Several pilots that flew with Blassie reported he was also dangerous. So Coop decided to fly with him and actually confirmed that the reports were true. Because of these findings, Coop grounded Lieutenant Blassie for two weeks. Now, during that two-week period, Coop completed his second Vietnam tour and transferred his flight to a new commander. The new commander lifted Blassie's grounding and Lieutenant Blassie was actually shot down on the next mission he flew. Because the crash was behind enemy lines, they were unable to recover him. In 1998, the US Department of Defense identified the remains in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It was Coop's young pilot, Lieutenant Michael Joseph Blassie. I'm going to provide a link to this story in the description so you can read about this because it's really, really interesting. So how did the watch exactly look when it got to me? Well, it wasn't exactly in the best condition. The crown and the stem was out of the watch because Ken said that he couldn't get it back in. And on top of that, the crystal had been replaced for a non-original one, so therefore the inner bezel wouldn't work at all. I did actually get the original crystal sent, but like I mentioned, it was in such a terrible condition because it had literally, well, <laughs> without exaggerating, been through a war. As you can imagine, it is definitely something that I'm going to replace. And being the Enica Guru guy that I am, you know that I've got some of those new old stock crystals just itching, itching to get on this watch once it's completed. So as I'm saying, I'm stripping down this watch now. I've broken down all of the automatic works, the dials off, the hands have been removed, and my impressions of how the watch looks are actually pretty good. Considering where this watch has been, I'm really happy to see that the loom is all in place, the dial is in pretty good condition, given all the expectations, and the overall presentation of the watch isn't too bad. Now, I've seen a few things that are going on. The setting lever, for example, is gonna, sorry, the setting lever screw is going to get replaced because it's definitely been worn, probably with a wrong screwdriver that's been used. I have many of these, so I'm gonna just bang a new one in there, and I think that's the most logical thing to do. So basically now I'm just removing the date wheel for this, using plastic tweezers, of course, guys. I always stress this enough, gotta use your plastic tweezers on the delicate parts. Delicate parts, plastic tweezers. Not so delicate, brass tweezers. That's my rule of thumb. So breaking down the calendar wheels, I'm just inspecting everything that I go along, of course. 
and then I can move on obviously to the rest of the watch. So I'm letting the wind down now on the watch now that I've taken off the automatic works, just making sure that there's no power in this. The watch wasn't running virtually at all. Uh, there was a little bit of power in there, but not that much. So it's always best still to check that there's no power remaining in it before you start removing the pallets, etc. Because obviously all of your wheels are going to fly everywhere and you're going to end up causing more damage than it's worth. And trust me, when it comes to vintage watches, you do not want to cause unnecessary damage. These things are old and you need to look after them. So the complete balance has been removed with the balance cock and now I can remove the pallet cock. That's just held in with the one screw as you can see. And then I've got the pallets underneath. And like I've just mentioned, my impressions of the condition of this watch are actually pretty good. And it goes to show you that quality is built to last. Now I have seen some watches in absolutely terrible conditions where gaskets have failed and water gets in there and moisture. But as you can see with the quality of this movement, it really does show you that these watches are designed to basically be used as tool watches. And being a military pilot, yeah, this watch is definitely being used as a tool watch. So undoing the screw for the ratchet wheel and also for the click. And then I can set those aside and remove those pieces. But I really like working on watches that have got a really interesting story. So every now and again, when you get an email that comes through and it's got such a nice story behind it, it's got to be for the channel, guys. I mean, this is another classic example. There was one last year that I did, which was a Sherpa Ops that also came from the US. And that also had a really nice story background. So I urge you to go and check out that video as well because it also was a great restoration and the story behind it also was really cool as well. Now one thing just to add that you might have just noticed there, there was a little bit too much play as far as I was concerned with, with the barrel bridge for where the arbor goes. So I'm also going to adjust that later on and make sure that I tighten that hole up a little bit. A little bit of uh, hammer use. So removing the complete barrel and underneath you've got the additional gear as well, which drives the automatic works. And now I can remove the train of wheel bridge. Held in with the three screws. And then I can just gently pry that off with a screwdriver. Quick inspection underneath to make sure everything is okay. There's a little bit of oil. Uh, excessive oil, let's say. Um, I've seen a million times worse. I mean, my days. Not like that uh, Grand Seiko video that I did a couple of weeks ago. I mean, that was a whole different level on an oil situation. It was not normal and it was not super fresh. So just taking out the escape wheel and I can continue to break down the train of wheels. Now the 1145, it is a really nice movement to work on. I've worked on these many times. You guys have probably seen this before, but I had to do this video because of the super nice story that was behind it. And I do like the way that there is a lot of jewels on this movement, but it's not over jeweled. I mean, you have some watches that I've seen where they have like 50 jewels and it's ridiculous. I'd say that a good 20% of those jewels are purely just for decoration and they just make it look as if it's better than it actually is. It's excessive and there's no need for it. I've seen some watches where there's around six or seven jewels around the minute wheel. Please explain to me why. There's no need for that. So I'm just removing the setting lever screw and it is damaged. Uh, and like I said, I'm definitely going to replace that. This is probably why uh, the owner of the watch uh, had difficulty uh, being able to screw the winding stem back in. Uh, because I had to use a very fine screwdriver just to try and get some grip on it. Uh, because, yeah, it, like a quarter of one of the sides was missing, basically. So I've got the sliding pinion and the winding pinion. And now I can just continue and breaking down the keyless works. Just removing the setting lever spring. And I'm holding it with some pegwood as well because I don't want the spring, the yoke spring, sorry, to fly and shoot across the room because yeah that that's annoying guys you don't want that it's not cool so the yoke springs removed and now i can remove the yoke and i'm not seeing rust and i'm really happy to see this and it goes to show Enica built some damn quality watches 
So pre-cleaning now, I'm making sure that I'm pegging all of these jewels. It's really important that you do this kind of thing. Basically, it helps your cleaning machine. It is absolutely pointless just banging an entire watch into a cleaning machine without pre-cleaning it. And it still baffles me that I see some people on videos doing that. It's not cool. It's not how it should be done. So breaking down the mainspring. So I've cracked open the barrel and now I'm just uh, removing the lid. Also going to pop out the arbor and then I can take out the mainspring and inspect it. Also giving that a clean as well. So I use pegwood and some old Rodico just to get rid of the excess oil because these things do really gunk up. And like I said, by doing this prior to deep cleaning, it really helps. I'm also going to give the pivots a clean as well with some of these Evo sticks. They're really cool. Uh, they just get into the hard to reach places and for a pre-clean, I think they're really useful to use. I don't think I've actually shown these on the video before. So this time I thought I'd go extra special with the editing and get in on deep. So that's the escape wheel once I've cleaned that up. And now I'm just preparing the uh, basket with all the parts, all the wheels, all the screws, everything going into the cleaning machine. Also, I am going to ultrasonic clean the case and the bracelet. And I did actually give it a light buffing with some uh, hand polish. Uh, no power tools whatsoever, just pure hand cleaning. And I just wanted to give it a nice little shine. And as you can see, it actually looks pretty fresh. Came up good. But Ken wanted, obviously, the original scratches. He didn't want anything changed. And I'm in complete agreement with that. I don't like over-polished watches, especially with vintage. It's not cool. So I'm popping on a new original Enica uh, Divet Crystal for this. Very unique for these watches because they actually hold the inner bezel in place as well. And this is where a lot of people get lost. They think, oh, I can just put a crystal that fits on. And it doesn't work because if you do that, you are not going to be able to move that uh, bezel underneath. It's not going to happen. They're pretty easy to fit. Uh, there is a crystal, uh, sorry, a tension ring that goes on the outside of the case, which you need to pop off as well, which you see that I did. And then I simply press that on afterwards as well. Quick inspection, obviously, to make sure the bezel is moving and uh, it's good to go. So I can rebuild the watch now, happy to say. Everything's been inspected and things are looking good. So just adding some chrono grease to the wall of the uh, barrel. And the original spring was in really good condition. Uh, I have no problems with this spring whatsoever, so I decided to reuse it. I didn't feel the need for a new spring. So just putting it through the main spring winder, carefully, carefully removing the part because you don't want the spring to fly out. It is important because you have to free the arbor. Sorry, not the arbor, where the bridle is. And then I can just click that into the barrel. You just line it up and then you just press the plunger on the top and it'll just pop the mainspring straight into the barrel. And it's really good because it saves any kind of contamination uh, without touching it. So in goes the arbor. Just making sure that I line that up. Also just adding a little 1300 as well to the top of the arbor where the lid will go. And then I can pop that on and that's friction fit. Now there's a gear that goes on the other side of the arbor as well, which drives the automatic work. So you need to flip over your complete barrel bridge and pop that on as well. That's also friction fit as well. And it's pretty straightforward to install. So now that that's out of the way, obviously I can tackle the Inca block capstones. You guys have seen this before. I will basically separate the two. I will clean the top one, clean the bottom one. I will oil it with 9010. I also give it fixer drop treatment as well so that it doesn't move the oil around, keeps it in one place, which is very important because you're working on a really small area. And then obviously you just basically pop them back together. 
and the oil will keep everything in one place. And what you're looking for, guys, is around 70% of the size of the capstone covered. And then you are wanting a nice bubble placement of oil that you can look through on the other side, which is exactly what you see on the screen right now. And that's where your balance stuff is gonna go. So popping that back into the movement and then I can close the shock setting. Cleaning off any excess dust with some Rodico or some finger juice. And then I can repeat the process on the other side. Exactly the same procedure, so I just speeded it up for you guys. But guys, if you are liking the video, please hit a like on it. I would very much appreciate it. It definitely helps the channel grow. And guys, you cannot lie, this channel is growing. It's super fresh. I'm mad happy where things are going. Over 6,000 subscribers now in the channel. And the channel has only been around for around a year and a half now. Uh, it's come a long way. I'm super happy with how the production has been going. Uh, the quality of the videos has improved. And you guys have definitely given me so much motivation to keep driving forward with this channel. So the bigger it gets, as far as I'm concerned, the watches will get better, the production will get better, and I'm really happy with how it's going. So please hit a like on it. And of course, feel free to subscribe if you feel fit. If you do subscribe, of course, don't forget that once we hit 10,000 subscribers, there is a chance for one lucky subscriber to win that 1952 Omega Seamaster bumper watch. I'm giving that away for absolutely free to one of the subscribers of the channel. I think what I'm gonna do is when we hit 10,000, which I think we're gonna hit, I don't know when, but I don't think it will be that long. I think I will do like an AMA video, like a live stream. And then towards the end of that video, then I will basically do a lucky draw based on the comments about who's gonna win. I haven't fully decided how I'm gonna do it yet. Obviously, I've got a lot of time to chew it over, uh, but that will be an awesome video. I'm really looking forward to that. So how's everybody's week been? Yeah. It's been, a, it's been a busy one for me. Yesterday, I was in France. I went to Lille. I went to the watch show. I think the last time I went there, I actually did a little bit of a quick live stream for you guys. And you know what was super strange? Two things. The first thing is, it was the first watch expo that I've been to where I didn't even spend a penny. Seriously, not a single euro was spent. I didn't find anything. Saw a lot of cool people. I actually had one French dude come up to me and he recognized from he recognized me uh, from the channel and shook my hand. I was like, whoa, a bit taken back by that. I'm not used to that. So that was really nice. He said, oh yeah, great channel. I really like watching you. I will not do a French accent, but he was seriously, seriously French sounding. So uh, I didn't catch his name. So many thanks for being a subscriber and I hope you enjoy the videos, mate. Also bumped into a, a, another guy that I know and he gave me a watch of his that he wants me to look at. So. I might do a live stream on that moving forward. It's a Satina watch, a uh, nice automatic. It's very bright in colors as well, super fluorescent hands on it. So maybe I'll do a live stream of that in the future. I haven't decided yet. But Lil was good. The weather was pretty good. The drive down was easy. It was relaxed. I got up really early for it. And I don't mind that I didn't get anything. It's not always about buying things. I just, I just like to go and obviously look at the watches as well and see people with a you know, like-minded hobby, as you guys know. So yeah, it was good. And for me, it's like about a two and a half hour drive there and a two and a half hour drive back. And uh, it's, it's pretty easy. So yeah, that was yesterday, which was cool. So as you saw, while I was waffling on about that watch expo, I did do an adjustment uh, to the uh, barrel bridge. Basically with a staking set and with certain stakes, you can make the hole larger or you can make the hole smaller. So I shrunk the size, I moved the metal basically, that's what you do. Uh, and I basically made the hole just a little bit smaller. The play was not that bad, uh, but I wanted it to be a little bit better because if you have too much play uh, for the arbor to move around, it will affect the amplitude of the watch. So I uh, resized the hole a little bit, made it a little tighter. And as you just saw earlier on, when I tested it, the arbor was still moving, obviously, nice and free, but there was nowhere near as much play on the watch. So that's really important. 
it's quite easy to do can be a little bit of trial and error but um, time obviously is on your side so it's not a big deal and the thing is as well is if you actually make it too tight well you can simply just again with a different stake you can move the metal again and also you can use a smoothing brooch as well that also can help as well if it's just a micro amount that you need to adjust a smoothing brooch will also help so building up the train of wheels bridge now I've put all the wheels in place as you can see and I'm just laying the bridge on top you have to be really careful as well to make sure that your pivots all line up so I hold it down with a piece of pegwood and then just using the tweezers I'm just manipulating the wheels just to make sure that they engage correctly. Once you know that everything's lined up then you can apply your screws but don't tighten up everything fully until you are 100% sure that you have everything lined up. Otherwise you'll break a pivot and then you've got to replace it. That's not fresh. It's not because replacing things costs money. It's not cool. So it's held in with the three screws as you can see and again like I said just take your time on it there's no rush oh man another thing as well that I was going to go on about my personal trainer at the gym selfishly decided to go on vacation how rude not cool and I hope he's watching this because I'm super not happy about the situation no sir I'm not because he's hooked me up with another guy and I really like the other guy he's a super nice guy as well but man he works me hard man like he really works me hard when I leave that place I feel destroyed like completely and utterly destroyed <laughs> so I'm kind of looking forward to my personal trainer coming back like please come back I never thought I'd say it but I actually really am so I'm just building up the motions works now so there's three gears that you can see now two of these, as you're going to see, have actually got reverse threaded screws. So if, you've not, if you're not familiar with these and you've not seen them before, a lot of watches, they make it easy for you. Because the head of the screw will have three lines on it rather than just one. And that's giving you a clear indication that, hey, 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 wait a minute, this is not a normal screw. What, what's wrong with this situation? I don't understand. It basically means that you tighten it the opposite way that you usually would. Um, it's so it doesn't unwind itself while the wheels are in motion. So on goes the uh, ratchet wheel as well. Just, just making sure that that engages correctly and it also in line with the click. And then I can tighten that up. So I'm just moving over to the pallet forks now. I'm applying some fixer drop to these. I also blow them off and I also re-clean the pivots as well because I don't want to leave fixer drop on the pivots. I cannot stress that enough. It just helps minimize any kind of potential drag which would then affect your amplitude. And it's seriously, trust me with this guys, the slightest amount of friction can cause such large amounts of amplitude displacement which is even for me it gets it's hard for me to to get my head around sometimes but it really just the tiniest little bit can make such a difference so clean 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 is the way forward so i pop these in and then i can put on the pallet cock held in with that one screw and then what i'm doing now is because i don't have the winding stem in i'm just basically screwing the ratchet wheel so that i can put some power into the watch so that i can engage the pallets as you can see ready for oiling now just oil in the exit stone on the pallet forks. Now I do this three times, a little bit of oil, then I tap it forwards five sets, and then I repeat the process three times. The other thing I do as well is, once I've done this, I take the wind out of the watch, I remove the pallet forks, I clean the pallet forks, and I put them back in. Because I wanna remove any of that excess oil that's on the exit stone, because I don't need it anymore, because I'm it's more about that I'm lubricating the teeth of the escape wheel than the pallet fork itself, so to speak. And again, it goes back to what I was talking about with amplitude. If you have too much oil that's still sitting on your pallet fork, it's going to create drag and you don't want that because then you're going to lower your amplitude. So I've just oiled up the watch. 
and now I can put in the balance just to fire up this watch. There we go. Happy to see this is running after all this time. And of course your a uh, sorry your uh, complete balance is held in with that one screw. And by the looks of things, we have completely finished on that side. So obviously now I'm going to turn the watch over so that I can tackle the other side. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start working on the keyless works. I've already got the setting lever screw, the new setting lever screw I might add, as you saw. And I'm just putting in the winding pinion and the sliding pinion. I've added on some grease onto that as well because it's a metal on metal component. So it's really important that you do oil and grease those accordingly. Just making sure that everything engages and then I can add in the winding stem. Now I did have to loosen off the screw a little bit for this, for the setting lever. And then we go, it's all nicely engaged now once I re-tighten that up. A little bit of grease onto the uh, winding pinion so that I can, sorry, the sliding pinion so for where the yoke's going to go. And then I'm also adding some 1300 oil to the posts. I like to do my oiling pretty much all in one go rather than oil then piece, oil then piece. If I'm working on a bigger sections, let's say the keyless works or the calendar works, then I will just oil everything where everything's going to go in and I'll do it all in one go because I just find it saves time. So on goes the minute wheel and also the intermediate wheel and now I can add the yoke. making sure it's engaging, also adding some grease between the yoke and the setting lever and then I can put in the yoke spring. I also add a little bit of 1300 as well between the yoke spring and the yoke. I've also greased up the arm of the setting lever spring and then I can just pop that in place holding it down with some peg wood because obviously I have a spring under there and I need to add a screw for this so I just want to make sure that everything's aligned and using a piece of peg wood it just makes life a hell of a lot easier. So again checking sure it's all engaged and then also again I've stressed this many times make sure that you clean off any excess grease that you might have put on the watch. There's no problem with using a bit too much grease. The problem is, is if you don't clean off afterwards. I mean, you've, you have a freshly clean watch. Why would you not want to keep it that way, that way basically? So it's really important that you do a uh, clean as you go as well. So adding the wheels for the date change. Both of these are also held in with one screw each. And then the date change lever, as well as the spring, which is going to come shortly. Adding the date wheel in, and I really like these Enica big fat red number ones. And I must admit, these replacements are getting harder to find. If you have one in terrible condition, good luck, because they're not that easy to find these date wheels. I only have a few left. So just adding these two little bridges on, they will keep the date wheel in place, held in with two super micro sized screws. So you have to use a really, really small screwdriver for these ones. And as I've mentioned before, pegwood is definitely your friend. I mean, some people use a uh, like a plastic piece to hold things down. There's no problem with that either. I just personally prefer pegwood. So I've just popped on the hour wheel and now I'm just basically just checking that the date changes correctly. A little bit of oil as well to the date lever tip. 
also cleaning off any excess because I, in my opinion, there was a little bit too much. And that just adds a little bit of lubrication to the teeth as it goes around. Also just buffing up that really, really nice looking date wheel. And now I can just fit the dial, guys. Getting close to finishing this uh, pilot's watch. It feels so strange talking about a diver's watch as a pilot's watch, but I mean, technically that's what it was. So just nipping up the dial feed screws, one on each side. And look at that loom, guys. It's just turned into this really nice, dark, orangey, yellow color. It's really, really cool. And now I can fit the hands, making sure that it's lined up at 12 and also that the date's turned over. And I can just press fit those on. Really nice handset. And again, what I will say about these Mark I hands, in all my time collecting Enica and Enica parts, I've never ever come across a set of new old stock Mark I style hands for these. Now these hands we also used on the Sherpa guide as well. And I've never ever come across a set of new old stock ones. Very, very, very hard to find. It's important as well, when you set your hands, make sure that the hands are not touching, make sure there's enough clearance, because if there is something touching, it will stop the watch 100%. So it's important that you take your time setting hands and keep checking and checking and checking each time you add a new hand. Obviously with a chronograph, it'll take a lot longer because, well, there's more hands. Yeah, I'm very happy with that loom. Really nice. So I'm just lubricating the automatic works now. I lubricate the reversing wheels and also the uh, rotor. You give them a soak for 10 seconds and then you let the lubrication dry for 15 minutes before you rebuild it. And then I can start obviously rebuilding the automatic works completely. So I'll add in a little bit of grease and then I also add a little tiny bit of 1300 to the post. Serious micro amounts, guys. You can see how the magnification on this is so strong, and yet the little blue dot you can see is so small. That's what you want. Less is more when it comes to oiling. I cannot stress this enough. I think I mentioned that pretty much every video, guys. It's super important. So this is the first generation of automatic works. Now with the 160 family, Enica changed their automatic work system. And if I'm honest, I'm not a fan of it. One, it's a bit more tricky to work with. And secondly, it's not a bi-directional rotor charge, meaning it will only charge it one direction the rotor goes. Whereas on the original version, which is the one that you're looking at right now, it will charge in both directions, regardless of which direction the rotor swings. And to me, I see that as more logical. So it's always been one of those things I've never understood why Enica changed that. And they came out with a rotor which basically removed 50% of the charging possibilities, basically. I, I don't see the logic behind that. I, I never will. So the bridge is held down with these two super micro screws. Just making sure that those pivots were engaged. And then I can add a little bit of 9010 to the jewels, obviously doing the underside now because, well, it's going to go on the watch and then I'm not going to be able to anymore. I'm also adding the screw in, which is friction fit for the rotor. It fell out. Uh, that's literally never happened before for me, even though they are just friction fit, but it's not something I would remove unnecessarily. So adding on the automatic works to the movement and do not press this on. When you lay it on to engage it, start to wind the watch and believe me, the pivot will find its way in the hole and you risk any kind of damage. It is the best way to do it. Held in with the two screws, tighten them up and you're good to go. And then I can obviously all the top side as well using 9010. And this watch is nearly rebuilt guys, nearly rebuilt indeed. 
So obviously now I can just case up this watch. We've got that new, new old stock Enica crystal on this watch and this watch is gonna pop. Let's not forget as well, it has the original Beads of Rice 19 millimeter Enica bracelet on as well. So add in some grease to the winding stem. And then I can obviously just fit that to the watch. In goes the movement holder. Again, another part that is not that easy to find nowadays if you have a damaged one. I can also add in the uh, clamp screws as well. And they're just held in with two screws. They will lift the movement up as you tighten them. So it creates a nice clearance and keeps everything in place. Add in on the rotor and then add in on the center screw. They also did two different types of those screws as well, which is also annoying because they are different sizes. So being a diver's watch and like any watch, it needs a new gasket. So I'm going to obviously fit a new one as well. I've already greased it as you can see, and then I can just pop that into the watch. Add in on the case back. And then I can refit this original Enica 19 millimeter beads of rice bracelet. Really nice, fully original, triple marked on the clasp and on the inside of the clasp as well as Enica. And then we get to see the timographer results. So like I said, this watch was not running, so I've used the original mainspring and I'm more than happy what I'm seeing. It will be fully regulated after 24 hours. And there we have it guys, the Enica Super Dive Ed Mark I. A diver's watch belonged to a pilot. What a tool watch. Guys, if you've got time, watch this video on the screen right now. And of course, till next time.